Two years ago, we had a bunch of logs delivered. We would cram saw milling that mountain of logs into beautiful timbers for our timber frame into just three weeks. Having never run a sawmill before, we were under the gun. Months prior, we got the amazing news that an army of people were coming from around the world to help bring this timber frame to life. We couldn't let those people down. Time constraints meant no time for nitpicking. We saved gobs of lumber and slabs to turn into future lumber, flooring, and even wood chips. The rest became firewood. Fast forward two years and we're working on building custom cabinets for the kitchenette area in our garage. We love butcher blocks and thought it'd be rad if we could build one. Oh, we're coming for you, Boneyard. We're coming for you. <laughs> While rummaging through our Boneyard, some attractive pieces in the firewood pile caught our eye. There's a lot of stuff in here that looks like, I'll be doggone, it would make a great countertop. We thought, what if we could rescue some scraps and build our countertop from the firewood pile? Even more special, this wood is left over from the timber frame project. Digging through a monster firewood pile is like trying to find a needle in a haystack. Thankfully, short, random, and weird pieces are perfect for a butcher block project. It took some pretty legit effort to get things dimensioned down to the widths and random lengths we'd need. All this firewood is random thickness, random width, a little soggy and covered in who knows what. Things are looking pretty rough and ugly at this stage, but that's okay because we have the Swiss Army knife of woodworking tools, a shopsmith. Because we're basically using tiny slabs, they lack a square edge. We're snapping a line and making one with a circular saw. We're also looking for any rot defects or other issues like cupping and weighing that we can remove now to save us work later. Butcher blocks are kind of like sausage. You can toss just about anything in there and it'll come out pretty good. At this stage, having way too much is better than coming up short, so we're cutting more material than we need. We made a rough calculation on linear feet, measured all the pieces, and then overcut by about 30%. We probably could have glued up at this stage as our table saw is pretty precise, but we're trying to make this top a masterpiece, so we're putting in some extra work. We ran each piece through an edge joiner to make it flat. This is critical before using a thickness planer. If it sounds like a lot of work, that's because it is. Hundreds of pieces, two sides, multiple passes. It'll make your everything hurt. So basically we've got this huge gob of sticks with two flat sides. It's time to get things uniformly dimensioned, remove knots and other defects, and square up the ends. The wood is really starting to come to life. To reduce the potential for error and give ourselves options for the layout, we planed each side to identical dimensions so you could rotate each piece into any configuration. We're also planing to the thinnest piece Honestly, it's really hard to measure accurately rough sawn wood that was cut with a chainsaw. It would have been a tragedy to glue this thing up and realize we had a thin piece in there. The pieces will be butt jointed. We could have finger jointed the ends, but that's another monstrous step that we just skipped on this project. Happily, 
we discovered a method using the miter gauge and belt sander attachment that made super quick work on squaring up and polishing the ends. Baby, this is getting exciting. Good thing we bought the family pack of clamps. All that obsessing over dimensions paid off. Our first successful glue up complete. OCD people would hate this part. Do you use two longs and a short? three shorts, a long and a medium, <laughs> sapwood, heartwood, sapwood, you get the idea. We got a little excited and our glue up was one board too wide. Oopsie. Time for the final trip through the planer. This removes glue drips and gets things uniformly flat, making for way less sanding in the future. You guys know how sometimes it seems like things are going a little too well? <laughs> Crud, we blew the breaker right in the middle of everything going perfectly good. And she fits. Firewood. That was firewood. Can you guys believe this? What a transformation. Holy catfish sticks. We found an awesome sink to complete this top. First, the length and the width get trimmed so we have proper references to install the sink. Every measurement and every cut at this stage is extremely crucial. One mistake and it's going in the burn pile. Cutting a sink hole is pretty nerve wracking. Cutting a sinkhole on a project that's this much work will make your butt pucker. We measured a lot, did a zillion test fits, and finally decided to just rip the band-aid off. It's a snug fit and it looks amazing. Here's hoping it fits the cabinets. We have squeezed every usable inch out of this space and that means things are snug. We had to do some finagling and customizing to get the sink to fit in such a tight spot. Well, we're gonna have to get really creative on how to lock it in, because there's like nothing to hook it to. Some creative cutting, some grinding, and a little bit of elbow grease, and this sink is definitely gonna work. Hot dog, it's starting to look like a beautiful countertop. 
way better than we could have imagined when we were out there rummaging through the wood pile. So we've got this beautiful top. Now what? Do we oil it? Varnish it? Epoxy? Here goes nothing. Oh man. Ah, no turning back now. <laughs> oh boy. And so now we just move it around. We decided after doing a small test slab, epoxy it is. If you ask any woodworker what their favorite part of a project is, it's probably applying the finish, where you finally get to see the wood grain and the color pop. In that moment, all the stress and worry of the project melts away, as you can see your work of art coming to life right before your eyes. This is our first time with an epoxy pour, and I'll just say it, epoxy is not forgiving to beginners. We did several coats trying to build it up and get the surface smooth. It didn't turn out perfect. We had to find some tricks and a bit of elbow grease to get it dialed in. It took a few college coats to learn the importance of a flood coat, a proper drop cloth, conserving epoxy drips, masking areas with packing tape, and how to use a torch to remove the bubbles. Thankfully, the solution to nearly every epoxy mistake is more epoxy. We like the benefits of epoxy, but we're not fans of the high gloss. So we did some research and we found that we could use some sandpaper and some steel wool to bring the finish down to a matte finish. The answer is it does dull. The other answer is it like incinerates the steel wool. In two seconds. In like two seconds. So that's good enough. It was super scary experimenting at this stage, but we finally found wet sandpaper was just the ticket. So basically this is where we're starting with this mirror gloss and this is where we're heading. It's kind of a muted finish and then we'll end up using like a carnauba wax to protect it. Unfortunately, none of our power sanders are rated for wet use, so we signed up for a good old arm workout. It ended up being a blessing though, because there's no dust, and we learned a dry eraser board eraser makes a stellar sanding block. That is definitely the secret. 600 grit with water. This turned out fantastic. Full disclosure, when we went firewood pile diving, we weren't sure what we'd end up with. This certainly turned out way better than we ever expected. If you're gonna get creative with your project, you've gotta be open-minded. Who knows, you just might hit a home run and surprise yourself with what's possible. So far, people's reactions have been just like ours. Wow. And of course, the obligatory running your hand across the top in disbelief. <laughs>